Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, I intentionally use these words, colleagues, because all of us here in this hall are actually colleagues, whether we are journalists, scholars, leaders of uh, religious communities, writers, and even politicians. We are colleagues because the subject which brought us here is a subject of uh, life for all of us. This is something which gives the aim to all our activities. And if we unite in, this underst in the understanding of this, then probably this conference will be a great success and a turning point and a starting point because all conferences should be judged not by the title, not even by the titles of the people attending, but by the results. And the results, that is actual, some, some actions and contacts. I hope we will all exchange our addresses, we will know our names, uh, we, we will know each other and we can do then something very important for this world and for the future of the world. Well, uh, as this conference, as so many other con uh, conferences, is using the word dialogue. Dialogue is everywhere. Dialogue is in the air. And uh, it became very fashionable during the last 10 or 20 years. The dialogue, the dialogue of religion, the dialogue of civilization, the dialogue of cul sorry, uh, cultures, and so on and so on. I am an old man now. I don't want to admit it, but uh, I'm afraid that everybody understands this. Uh, and I remember that there was time when the most popular world in the mass media and even in the conversations of people between themselves was another world, the war. I'm uh, representing the pre-war, pre-World War II generation. And there was always talk about war, about war with Germany, uh, uh, against Germany, inside Germany, and so on. And after that, there was a Cold War, another time, but it was also, that, that was the World War III. Now, the war, is uh, the term war is more or less replaced by the word dialogue. Of course, there is a war even now, and uh, we have uh, a war in uh, Libya, for, for example, but that is also a sort of a dialogue, but another type, not, not our type of dialogue which we, we, we gathered here to discuss. Now, why? Why dialogue? There is a very interesting anniversary this year, partly explaining why the dialogue as a term is becoming so widespread now. And one thing is, uh, I want to remind you, because coming from Russia, I can't admit this, the 50s in, on the 12th of April, there will be the 50th anniversary of uh, Gagarin's flight in the space. The first man came to the space, 50 years. This year is also a 20th anniversary of the end of the Cold War, more or less, but anyway. So this is two, two marks which are really explaining what is going on now and what, the, what we are looking for in the future. The first, even after the Gagarin's, Gagarin's flight, we understood, and he himself said it from there. He said, our planet is so beautiful, but he added, but so small. It is a very small planet now. It's not the 18th century to say nothing about the ancient times. It is small and it is very, very vulnerable. And we understand it now to the full extent. And what is going on in one 
corner of the globe. Well, globe has no corners, but anyway, you understand. I, <laughs> I'm <laughs> not a mathematician. What is going on there affects people living thousands of miles from there. And the Cold War, uh, in my own opinion, there are no losers and winners in the Cold War. I mean after, as there were never winners or losers during the Cold War. But the new stage of our understanding of our life, of our future, uh, and all dangers to the life, that, that is the status we came after the Cold War now. And uh, the planet is vulnerable for everybody, not for the working class. I'm using the quite familiar terms for Albania and Russia, of course. Not the working class, not the capitalists, not Negroes, no Indians, no others, no Christians, but for everybody, for all and each, this is a special time in history when, whenever, whenever you are, whoever you are, you are faced with the same challenges, challenges to the whole world and to each man and woman also, of course. Actually, it is the second time in the history, in a way, in history, because uh, we can speak about the sim similar situation many, many thousands years ago during the prehistoric time when each tribe could liquidate itself in case they didn't find the common language with the other tribe or with the nature. There was a danger to mankind or to small portions of mankind, whatever we call them at that time. Of course, uh, there could be no history in case this old, the ancient people couldn't find the language, the language of unity, the language of survival. At that time, of course, even in case all people would disappear from the earth, well, nothing will actually affect the planet. The planet would be even much more beautiful. Now it is different situation. Different situation because the mankind can eliminate itself, definitely. Not myself, not our family, but all people in the world quite easily. And not only people, but also the plants, the stars, the seas, whatever it is. We can really destroy the planet. And paradoxically, the question of unity is coming from the feeling of fear. We all want to survive. And that makes us, whether we are uh, self-centered or not, that makes us, that pushes us into some sort of unity. We have to stretch our hand and start the dialogue. Otherwise, there will be no, no, no future for, for everybody. Of course, I'm talking banalities, but uh, sometimes it's necessary to repeat the most banal things to understand what is going on. So the dialogue is a sort of instrument. This is the form. The form, well, dialogue, it is not, not a monologue. It is always uh, an attempt to explain myself, of course, but also it is not enough. It is not enough for me to explain myself. I want to be heard. And I want to understand the partner, and the partner wants to be heard and understood, of course. So a dialogue, I would call the instrument for unity. And what is the use of unity? 
though it seems to me absolutely clear, but still. Now, the dialogue of religions. We are using these words in a very positive sense. The Conference on Unity of Religions. And it goes without saying this is positive, this is quite possible, and so on and so on. In my opinion, the question is not so simple. Not all dialogue of religions could be positive, and a lot could be quite negative. One personal remark. Uh, I will be sometimes referring to the country uh, which is far away from Balkan, Europe, and even from Russia. I mean India. To study this country, uh, I gave about 60 years of my life, and of this life, uh, speaking from Hindu point of view. So uh, there was a big parliament of religions. One was in Chicago in the end of the 19th century, another was in Calcutta. And there were so many, about 20,000 of uh, representatives of different religions, of scholars, and so on and so on. And they were all, of course, parliament of religions, they were all speaking from the terms of uh, dialogue of religions. But almost 60% of the people who spoke from the stage, they were speaking like that. All religions are equal, all religions are good, but my religion is more equal, my religion is much better. Please accept the truth through my lips it's coming to you my voice is talking uh, through with my voice the god is talking to you and there were even some absolutely indecent remarks from the representatives of a very tolerant hindu community about uh, well i hate the image of your jesus christ he is so white and uh, he is so not un absolutely unlike us. What? That, that was, well, I understand it to some extent, but I do not understand when you pronounce these things at the parliament of religions. So the dialogue of religions, if the speakers will focus on fundamental questions of religion, about the God, about the way to God, and about the way of life. Should I go to pilgrimage, and where? Should I go to Mecca, or should I go to uh, Israel, and so on? That is absolutely useless, and even can make a lot of harm. And that is not for us, for the ordinary people, to speak on these terms. It is not for us. I have my own beliefs, it is at my home, it is in my heart. You have different beliefs, of course, but you have a different type of dress. You have a different accent. You have a different uh, cuisine and so on. Should I quarrel with you when we need unity about your way of dressing? No. Should I quarrel about your way to God? Don't impose on me, that's another thing. But that, that is up to you. So it is not the question of dialogue of religion to discuss these fundamental questions. At the, at the same time, we all are talking about the necessity of dialogue of religions. Why? Because there is another scope of problems. The, all religions, and especially leaders of religion, can sit at the round table can sit in the mosque or in synagogue, I don't know, but at, at the TV station, and to discuss how the mankind, not of this creed of another, but all people, can join hands and to meet the challenges about survival of the mankind and not of the uh, possible victory of one religion over another. The same comes not only to religion, but also to the dialogue of religions, all, and science. 
It is still almost not going on, but we need it, especially for our children. Now, I'm using the word challenges already several times. Now, what kind of challenges? Again, I will not say, uh, don't look at me that uh, awaiting that I will see uh, something different from you and I will say something new for you. No. That's why I'm key speaker. That's <laughs> just, just to underline some things. And what kind of challenges? We have a lot of. I am not talking now about political, political conflicts. They are still going on, but we are happy enough that uh, this uh, political conflict is, uh, it is not something like a world of fire, not yet at least. But we have ecological problems for the whole mankind. We have demography. We have, of course, we have cultural crisis all over the world and, uh, well, it is not that audience, but uh, in case I would speak in Russia, I will say, and don't blame the United States only for this. You can blame the United States, you can blame Russia, you can blame my favorable India. When there were, remember Indian cinema, which was a little bit melodramatic, but it was very kind and full of songs and dances. Now it is full of kicks, books, and all these things. Together with dancing, but still, but <laughs> that sorry, is the remnants of sorry this. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes. One minute. Yes. Coming to the end. Technological. Look at Japan. So we have to meet all these challenges. Uh, now, we are here, actually, we are here in this audience to make plans to cure the planet to cure the mankind, to give some help, to show the way to light a candle in the darkness. Uh, that brings us uh, to a very important subject. I will only name it, the education. It is not only to do something which is absolutely necessary, but it is also to educate our children our grandchildren, and already two months I can say our grand-grandchildren, so <laughs> putting a personal touch, to save them. But to save them we have to rewrite to some extent our past, showing not the history of wars, but the history of human contacts. And we must make plans for future. Now, one main question, how to unite the religions, how to make the basis for, uh, the basis for uh, education system. In all religions you have the ethical core, which is the same. If you quote some ethical uh, sentences from the Bible, from Quran, from Bhagavad Gita, from wherever, and you don't mention from where it comes, you will never recognize, because it is the same. This is the wisdom of the mankind. We must put it on ethic. Uh, speaking at Gulen conference and not mentioning Futhua uh, Gulen is rather uh, impossible. So I want to say that the educational system of Gulen, which is spreading now all over the world, even in Russia, we opened several schools in Moscow and are planning even a university on Gulen type. That is something which Turkey, new Turkey, is bringing to the world. I found it is very much came to Albania. And that is something very important. There are always some people whom uh, the contemporaries never understand to the full. And Gülen, like Mahatma Gandhi was and others, and then time comes, the generation, after the generation, the people are coming to understand them. So it comes to Gulen. The mankind is coming to his ideas now. The last sentence. I want to congratulate the organizers of this conference. The subject is very important, and we already enjoy the hospitality. What brought me? Because there are so many conferences, as I said, that. Uh, about dialogue and about uh, Gulen and so on. Well, I will be frank, 
First of all, curiosity, because I'm an old man, I repeat, and uh, I have uh, links in different stratas of society, and I never, never, never met in my country any person who visited Albania. Never. So, of course, I was curious to come to see with my own eyes. On the uh, border, I was stopped for 25 minutes because the uh, officers uh, have seen for the first time this type of passport, and they were reading it <laughs> with all eyes available. Uh, I think this is very important that Albania starts this conference and probably some movement which will be coming from here. Because this is the middle of Europe, this is near to Africa to some extent, this is uh, actually the open door to everybody. And uh, in Balkan region it is very important because of, because of the history. Now in the very beginning, I started with the word colleagues. My hope is that tomorrow, by the end of this conference, we'll call each other friends. And that will be one of the aims of this conference which will come true. Thank you.